<laughs> oh, yeah, probably so. All right, anybody else have anything? Remember them in prayer? Let's have a prayer and then we'll start. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this Lord's Day. We're thankful that we've been blessed with being able to be here. We pray your blessings on those who have been mentioned, Donna's nieces and their family, that they could recover from their illnesses. Father, we know that there are others who are sick, and we pray your blessings on them, those who are confined to home and nursing homes, maybe in the hospital, and we pray that you would provide them with comfort and care through the doctors and nurses, and that they would return to their health, if it be your will. Father, we know that there are families that are grieving, and we pray your blessings on them. We pray your continued blessing on our nation, that we <clears throat> can have leaders that would make good decisions. We pray, Father, that you would be with us throughout the next few days as we prepare for an election. We pray, Father, your blessings that we would have quiet and peaceable lives. Father, we pray that you would be with us throughout our study. Be with Mike as he travels and keep him safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're possibly going to wrap up the book that we've been in for quite a while. Uh, Tell me the story of Jesus. Basically a survey of the life of Christ. And I'm not going to do a lot of review because typically I do try to review what we've talked about, but we know we started in the very beginning. We know we've talked about uh, prophecies fulfilled. We've talked about miracles and wonders and signs. We talked about his death. And, uh, you know, as, as I've mentioned throughout the time period that we've been studying this, I don't think we can overemphasize his uh, death because, um, you know, he did that for us. His death was for us. And uh, now as we wrap up, we're in the resurrection. And we're going to be talking about the ascension back into heaven. You know, when we think about the resurrection, Jesus was crucified on Friday and he was raised on Sunday. Uh, Some people would like to claim that he was crucified on Thursday and raised on Saturday, but You know, obviously, we read this a couple of weeks ago, Luke 24, on the first day of the week. That was the day that they went to the grave and he was gone. So if we count backwards, that's Friday. Three days backwards, that's Friday. So he came forth from the grave. When the Lord comes, our bodies will be resurrected. The Lord's resurrection indeed was a bodily resurrection. Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, we're told that he is the first fruits of the dead. And so what follows after the first fruits is the same as the first fruits. So our resurrection will be a bodily resurrection. We know that our bodies will be changed. Now we have no idea what that change will be because none of us have ever seen it. Um, But we can just be assured that that's what's going to happen because of what happened with our Lord. Christianity is based on solid, rock-solid evidence. We've talked about over the time that we've been studying this book that... There are proofs, there are historical proofs, there are things that people have written that were not Bible writers, I'm going to call, the apostles or any of the other writers of the Bible. There are things that we can go back and look at historically, and so we can prove the Bible, things that happen. We can prove the existence of God through... uh, looking at the universe through 
rational arguments of his existence. You know, without God, none of us would be here. This earth wouldn't be here. This universe wouldn't be here. And so, so many people deny that there is a God. We can see that Christ was divine. The deity of, deity of Christ comes from, as we've talked about, the miracles, the things that he performed, raising people from the dead, changing things from one state to another, walking on water, and we could go on and on about the things that he did. One, I just see the name Peter here that I'm going to mention, and I think about how Peter cut the ear off um, of the servant of the high priest. And then immediately that ear is healed. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, I think it was in here last week where we were, or a few weeks ago when we were talking about the pain and the anguish and the suffering that the Lord went through and I'd cut my finger, you know. So we think about how that my finger still hurts, actually. Yeah, yeah. But... um we think about and complain about a little cut on our finger, but think about what the Lord went through. So, I, And I'm not in by any means comparing my finger to the suffering of the Savior, but I'm just saying that's our outlook on life, a little cut on our finger. But he was beat, and beaten and uh, nearly died, or could have nearly died, or, or some people did die as a result of the beating he took. And then he was put on the cross. And so I think we focus too much on what we feel and what we know instead of what actually he went through for us. Uh, again, we've mentioned the fulfillment of prophecies, the virgin birth, and now the resurrection. All those things prove his deity. The ins inspiration of the Bible. The internal proofs where... You know, you think about uh, prophecies, and I think Mike might have mentioned this or I heard it somewhere else where, you know, I believe it was Isaiah who named a king who would not be king for three or four hundred more years. But he told who he was, told his name, and then it told what he was going to do. And then three or four hundred years later, it happened exactly like it was told. And so throughout the entire Old Testament, we can see those proofs and evidences. <clears throat> we can see external evidences. And all these things are unimpeachable or undeniable or we cannot prove otherwise. You know, we go back to the uh, creation of the world. And uh, there's no way that something can come from nothing. And there had to be a God. There had to be someone to create this world. And without a doubt in my mind, it's God. Peter said in John chapter 6, We have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, we talked about Peter. And I, eventually I'm going to move on. But we've talked about Peter. and. Um, his denial, and then we talked about his uh, admission that uh, he loved the Lord. So he denied him three times, and then three times he told the Lord he loved him. So we think about Peter and all the things that he went through, but here in John 6, he says, We know and we believe, and you are the Son of God. And again, the, the resurrection is proven. It's, it's there for us to read. Witnesses saw the Lord alive. And, um, you know, there's so many other things in, in the history of the world that we, none of us have seen and that other people haven't seen, but we all believe that it happened. You know, um, there's so much controversy or speculation in our world. You know, men were on the moon, but now people say men weren't on the moon. It was all a, a hoax. I believe men were on the moon. They were alive and, and said they were. I don't know. And, and until they died, they said they were. So, But again, as we see these things, there's historical proof. The empty tomb was there. 
Witnesses to the resurrection can be shown to be honest, competent, sufficient in number. They made their testimony where it would stand in court. Again, we had guards there uh, who would have been killed if the Lord's body would have been stolen or, or what. And, you know, we don't have any uh, anything that says what happened to those individuals that were guarding the tomb. They may have still been uh, killed as a result of this because of dereliction of duty, but there was no way that they could prevent that body from coming up from that grave. We, the Lord's Day is a memorial to the Lord's resurrection. That's why we're here today. And that's why in just a little while we will uh, eat the Lord's Supper because it is a memorial, it's a recollection of His resurrection. And we've talked about the appearances and we're not going to get back into those, but we know he appeared before many people and at one point up to 500. The tomb is empty. The resurrection occurred. And now the ascension of Jesus. Let's, uh, let's see where we want to go. Again, this is a miraculous event. Jesus' earthly existence began with a miracle. He was conceived by a virgin. And then his last event on this earth, also miraculous. His ascension is discussed in several passages in the Old Testament. Psalm 24 mentions it. Daniel 7 mentions it. And then throughout the Gospels. Uh, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 3. All those talk about his ascension. And then in Acts, and I think we'll turn there in Acts in just a few minutes, but Jesus' earthly mission is finished now. He died on Calvary. But we know that because he did come from that grave, because he did ascend back into heaven, he is alive. And so he is very active still in our lives. And he will be forever until he appears again with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and all the dead will be raised. Let's look at a couple of passages. Let's start with Mark chapter 16. All right, it's uh, beginning with verse 19, Mark 16, 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So here Jesus had just been with the apostles and we go back to 15. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So he had given them their commission. He had sent them out to preach. And then in verse 19, it tells us that he ascended back into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Let's look at Luke 24. In verse 50. 
Here again, he's with uh, the apostles. Uh, verse 36, it says he has appeared to the ten. And then in verse 39, it says, Behold my hands, my feet, that is I myself handle me and see, for the Spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So again, proof of the resurrection. Then in verse 50, And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. And then one more, let's turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. Verse 9, Acts 1, verse 9 says, And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Then verse 12 says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Let's look at 11 just uh, for more information. Verse 11 says, Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So verse 12 tells us where they were. They were, uh, he ascended from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. Verse 12 tells us it's a Sabbath, Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem. But, uh, they say there in verse 11, I'm sure the, the crowd was there and they saw Jesus go into heaven. And the amazing thing, I think in just a few minutes, it's going to say was helicoptered by clouds. But just think in our time period, that would be something, a, a motorized something that would take someone from the ground up to the sky, airplane, helicopter. You know, in the first century, there was no such idea of that. So, But they would have been amazed to see someone from the earth rise up and go into heaven. And so why stand ye here gazing? The same Jesus is, it, same Jesus is taken, and he's going to come in like manner. So at some point, whenever um, the time comes, when the Lord or when God decides... Jesus will come back from the clouds and take the faithful into heaven. All will be raised from the grave. Those that are alive and remain will be taken up as well. The Lord left this earth blessing people. Back in... Uh, Luke 24 that we just read, he says, in verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethlehem and lifted up his hands and blessed him, blessed them. So, you know, from the cross, he was thinking about others. He was there in pain, but he was concerned about the salvation and souls of other people. And here, as he is preparing to go back to heaven, he is concerned about other people, and he blesses them. Then we're told in verse 9 of Acts 1 that a cloud received him out of their sight. The clouds, in a sense, were his chariot to take him into heaven. Or the clouds could have been like the Shekinah, a symbol of Jehovah's presence. You remember back in Exodus chapter 13, how God provided a cloud by day and a fire by night. And so here, another reference to a cloud. This cloud is maybe the presence of God, and it might be uh, similar to that that the uh, Israelites saw. So then, fourthly, he was received up into heaven, and he sat down on the right hand of God. 
You know, that's similar to what we read about David's throne. And so Jesus now is in heaven. And His work is not over. He's still there interceding on behalf of each one of us. So it's not like He just came to this earth, performed the miracles, signs, wonders, was crucified, raised from the dead, and is now just waiting in heaven. He still has work that He does on our behalf. So His whole earthly life was on our behalf. And now what He's doing in heaven is on our behalf. Luke 24, 52 says they worshipped Him. So the disciples knew that He was deity and they worshipped Him. And then they returned to Jerusalem from this location. And we know what's next. Uh, as we get into the book of Acts, we know what happens the following uh, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, about 10 days later from this point in time. I'm sorry, it's not 10, uh, it's not 10 days from uh, this day because, but Pentecost is on a, on the first day of the week. The appearance of angels. We've talked about all along from his birth, from the conception, all along since we've learned about Jesus, about angels' appearance and, and their activity and how they're involved in his life. It says that there were two men who stood by him in white apparel. And so, no doubt, angels in human form. Angels had also, as we mentioned, attended to his birth. Think about the temptation in Matthew chapter 4 and Mark 4, how Jesus was led up into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. Angels ministered unto him. And then in uh, his agonizing experience in Gethsemane, again, angels were present. And then Matthew 28 tells us that there were angels at the resurrection. So the message of these angels was twofold. There was a question, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Again, as we mentioned, the, the marvelous event, why stand here and look at that? Because all the things that you've been told for all these years, and now they're all fulfilled. And so the second thing is there is a glorious promise. And that promise is this same Jesus who was taken up from this place will return again from heaven. So we have to be prepared. We have to be watching. We have to be ready because that day and hour, no one knows. Jesus will return just as he ascended. Now we're going to talk about some of those things that he's, he continues to do as we await the second coming. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this in other classes before and other areas that the apostles and the disciples and all those that were there then really didn't expect that it would be 2,000 years later and the Lord still hadn't returned. But he has not. And, um, but they assumed that it would be something done quickly. Let's turn to First uh, Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 tells us that Christ is our mediator. In, the, in verse 4 it says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the desire. And then verse 5, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So we know a mediator is a go-between. So we have access to the throne of God through His Son and our Savior, Jesus. He is available for us at any time of any day. Let's look at Romans 8, 34.
Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As, is it, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He is our intercessor. We go to the throne through our Savior. When we pray, we pray in his name. We pray through Him. He relays our needs and messages to the Father. Let's look at a couple more. Matthew 28. Matthew 28. And we'll start our reading at 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus is our companion. He is there, he says, until the end of the world, he will be with us. And so because he is with us, we have to make the decision in our lives to be with him. We have to do as he said. You know, the 11 gathered here and Jesus uh, told them to go into all the world. Teach all nations and baptize them. And that's our responsibility as well. A couple more things. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we know this is where they gathered in Jerusalem on the first day of the week. It says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, in verse 1, they were all together with one accord. And then Peter preached that first gospel sermon, pricked those individuals to their heart, and they wanted to know what they had to do to be saved. And then he told them in verse 38 to repent and be baptized in to receive the remission of their sins. You know, some of these people were those who had been there, who had crucified the Lord. But there in verse 47, we see what Jesus continues to do as he is sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So the Lord continues to add people to the church his body, as they are saved, as they fulfill the responsibilities that they have, each of us have, to turn from our sins, confess him as the King, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Son of God, and then we are baptized and added to the church. In 1 John 2, 1, it tells us that he is our advocate. Again, like our mediator, our advocate. We've talked about advocate before, and that's like our lawyer or our attorney on our behalf. Hebrews 2 tells us that he is our high priest. And let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15.
We'll start reading at verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he hath all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put, accept, I'm sorry, accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Jesus is our King. He was the first fruit from the grave, as we talked about. And then he will, at some point, deliver the kingdom to God, his kingdom. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And let's look at uh, one more and then we'll move on. Psalm 23. Psalm 23, one everyone's familiar with. He is our attendant at death. Verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So our Savior who died for us, who came from the grave from us, is there for us at our death. And we should be comforted by his rod and his staff. When we look at, um, I believe it's Luke chapter 8, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Maybe that's Luke, six, Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We're told that the rich man died and was buried. But Lazarus was escorted by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So we know that the faithful are provided comfort and guidance by the Lord at their death. As we finish up here about his unfinished work, so he has been our mediator, our intercessor, our companion. He is the one who adds the faithful saved to the church. He is our advocate. He is our high priest. He is our king. He is our attendant at death. And finally, he's going to be our judge. Let's look, we'll look at one more passage and then we'll be done. Acts 17. Acts 17, let's look at verses 30 and 31. In the times of this ignorance God winked, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. So Jesus is there, our advocate, our intercessor, our high priest, our king. He is there taking care of our needs as we live on this earth. But there's going to come a time when we aren't on this earth, whether it be by death or his coming. And on that day, he's going to be our judge. And we're going to need to be faithful. We're going to need to be seen 
in his sight as one of God's children. Or the message that we get on that day will certainly not be a good one. He is there now for us. And so we have to be here now for him. So that in the end, we hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in. And so while we still have breath and while we still have time, we need to be working for the Lord because there is a day that He will be our judge. Any comments or questions? I'm going to stop there. I'll probably have, based on what I see here, one more lesson in this book. Now, I thought I would get done today, but I'll probably have one more lesson in this book. And then uh, Mike will be in here for a few Sundays while I'm working on something else. I'm, I'm thinking about going into the Old Testament, a study in the Old Testament. If somebody has something different that you would like me to try to work on, I will certainly do that. You'll just have to let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to go into a study of a survey of the Old Testament, kind of an overview book by book. And then I'm going, from what I've done so far, I really hadn't started on it, but I'm going to pick out some character, Bible characters, and talk about them, maybe one class period for each of those. But uh, if you have a particular one that you would like to know about or uh, enjoy studying about, let me know that as well. And I will try to add that if it's not already. I'm I'm up to about 20 lessons, but again, I hadn't started the first one, so it's all a dream. <laughs>